24 seven uh, Zoom platform, you can use the password and uh, link uh, at any time for your own personal uh, fourth discussions. Uh, in the meantime, let's move on to the uh, fourth programming challenge. Uh, I'd like you all to uh, think about future fourth programming challenges. Uh, Bill might give us like a 30 second description of what makes for a, a good uh, challenge so that uh, we can uh, all contribute in the future. Uh, one that came to me uh, is calculate the uh, fourth meeting dates uh, for uh, SVFIG uh, meeting dates for the next uh, random uh, year. So you put a year in and it lists the month and day of the, uh, the meetings for the 12 uh, meetings. And if anybody wants to hear the rules for that, you know, it's the fourth Saturday of the month, except for November and December, or the third Saturday. And uh, on with the show. Bill, it's all yours. Very good. Thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, the fourth challenge is could use um, math functions that we're generally familiar with, things like the greatest common denominator transcendentals, uh, geometric relationships. Uh, the hard things are graphics because all uh, computers not necessarily have graphics with them, but things you can do on a, uh, a regular character screen. Um, mostly we're interested in the logic that goes behind whatever the item is. And um, so we've done in the past, we, well, we got involved with uh, uh, Roman numerals, factoring, uh, representations for sign functions. Um, I'm not sure I we presented my one that was a uh, fair calculator for an Uber driver, but a simple problem like that is a good one. Um, how could you do a fair calculation for an Uber driver and uh, where you can do a log and the log would integrate his uh, fair receipts by day and by day of the week and so on. So the one today, oh, I'm gonna go to uh, gallery view and the topic is a calculation of leap year for a, a given year number. Uh, is, it a, uh, is it or is it not a leap year? And then for extra credit to do the same thing where the input is expressed as a Roman numeral. So uh, do we have any participants who are going to address the challenge today? Uh, the best way probably would be to use the raise your hand, click at the bottom. So Brad Nelson's in. Uh, anybody else in for the challenge? Uh, I see Brad. And later on, it would be okay to interrupt if you wish and uh, jump in. We'll, uh, we'll go to Brad Nelson first. And um, I guess this, I'll, I'll preface by the, the simplest understanding rules for uh, for uh, um, leap year is, is the year divisible by four? It has to be. And is it divisible by 100? It should not be, cannot be, unless it's divisible by 400. So you have three rules, uh, divisible by four, divisible by 100, divisible by 400. There also is a sophisticated one that goes out to, I believe, 83,000 years but I've not seen exact references on how to accomplish that. So let's go to Brad. Brad, what's your uh, solution? Brad may not have his sound on. So, so, I, so I did this during the meeting, believe it or not. So that's, uh, uh, that'll, if there are any errors, that'll be the thing. Um, so um, what I've done here is uh, I, you've got a, you know, a number coming in and I'm uh, doing a slash mod to, to split it out into the, uh, uh, the portion that's divisible by four or not. And then because that leaves the, uh, the larger portion, I do a, a slash mod again on 25. So I get the piece that's you know, now divisible by 25 times four, so the hundred, and then uh, just a, 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 a 
a four mod and that, so that leaves sort of the divided out pieces of the three. And then uh, I can go through and uh, check to see if the appropriate pieces are equal uh, to, uh, to zero or, or not. Um, but I, you can optimize this, although it makes it, it's already a little bit opaque, but you can strip out that first uh, does not equal zero because you're oaring it with a thing that uh, is already a, uh, on a two's complement machine is already a mask. So if you, uh, you can make that simplification. And if you want to go one step further, you can also get rid of the, uh, the second one and, and do that. Although now you're getting something where you don't get a zero and a negative one, you get a, a zero and a non-zero value for, for the answer. So that's sort of my, my most compact ver version of it. I, I also did the Roman numerals. Um, and uh, I used a used create does do it. I uh, keep a very so I don't do the most general sort of. There are some versions of Roman numerals where you uh, you can you you can do sort of multiple things in front of some tracks. It only supports a canonical sort of style Roman numerals. But what I do is I keep track of whatever the prior digit was, uh, prior numerical value was, and then at each step I look and see. Have I, uh, have I increased in value versus the prior one? And in that case, I do the fix up to, to correct for the fact that uh, there's a, sub, a subtraction that has to happen. And otherwise I simply update the prior value and then add. And so that lets me define a, a table of numbers. You could do those you know, directly, but that's not as fun. So I use a little bit of uh, uh, sort of carnal knowledge of, of GeForce to be able to uh, execute a, a, one, a one character word and then loop through the characters in the next word so that I can do uh, something like this. And let me switch over to, uh, let me switch over to a different screen here. Does that, does that show up? If I, if I go in here, the way this works, yes. uh, so if I, if I put in, say, you know, year MM, MM, X, X, I, I, I guess we're on, you know, that, that will give me on the stack that. And so I can do, you know, okay, are we, are we in a leap year? No, we're not. But if we go two more years, we will have one. So. Are there questions? Um, Do I understand it right that you parse out each letter and the letter is a fourth word which then executes? Yes, and so of course notice one, one uh, unfortunate problem with that that I probably could sort through with vocabularies given a little more uh, massaging is that I'm redefining the word I, which uh, is, a, is unfortunately uh, one of the core words. And so on the one hand, it's a joy of force that you can do such a thing and, and, and not have any huge tr trouble pop up immediately. But I imagine if you were using this in any substantial way, you would probably want to uh, put it in its own vocabulary or some such. I would like to congratulate you on that. That is beyond forth-like to turn your user input into fourth words and execute them. That's really good. I really love it. What a wizard. <laughs> Actually, I think that is um, one of the things that I frequently refer to in the past is in Lisp, uh, um, code is data, but in fourth, data is code. Indeed. <laughs> I, I see something. I read that recently. I see things in the chat. They're not, not questions. So cool. I will stop sharing and hand, hand it back to you, Bill. <laughs> very, very, really good. Uh, Did you use the hook for rot missing in uh, GFOF, or how is it implemented? I, I uh, so I I used find name and then I used uh, you know from name token to this name to int or something to go from a name token to an execution token and then run it. And I have to be careful to store stash away my stack so that I'm not you know. Uh, when I when I call execute, so I've got the right stuff there. But I could splash it back up on the screen. Let me do that real quick. If you want to 
Very, very good. Do we have any other participants that want to join in? Oh, there, there we go. This is this is the this is the thing. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So. I just I'm going to be chuckling on that all day. I just love that. Thank you, Brad. <laughs> really good. Um, any other people who want to join in on the a challenge before I do a wrap up? Seeing none. Okay, we'll now dive into fourth understanding leap year. So our challenge that we see uh, from uh, Brad's example, for example, we're gonna take a number in and determine logically, is it a year or not? And then for the extra credit, handle Roman numerals. Uh, here's a sample that came in by email and uh, um, it's along the line of Brad's, which is a one word solution. In this case, this is very logical. And Brad's was kind of elegant because he was doing the slash mod. This is much more pedestrian where it just divides by uh, the uh, year um, by 400, by 100 and by four, extracts the logical values, ands them and ors them together and gets back a logical value of zero or, or uh, uh, zero or minus one, true or false. So there is your three line simple solution. Now we are going to deviate dramatically from that because I'm saying that for every small problem, there resides inside it a larger problem to be solved and also to be benefited from and learn from. So I'm gonna structure my solution as sort of a, a, a prototype AI solution where we do a, a you know, classification and selection. And the idea is that it could be expanded for a larger use for a general purpose. And in this case, there's a number of tasks that are done, but each word does exactly one task, very factored. When I started writing this, I just wrote one word at a time. And whenever a road got, got more complicated, I just broke it up and wrote two. And finally, I'd like to have the report in plain language, uh, such as a user would want to see. Here's my top level uh, word in this case, which is answer. And it does the LY process, which is leap year process, and it does a selection. And the classifier, which is this leap year process, the first thing it does is it sees, is the word, is the number divisible by four? And if so, it outputs the least significant bit as one. If it's divisible by 100, it then puts in the next significant bit as a one of uh, the number two bit. Is it divisible by 400? It, it ors in the value of four, the next bit. So what we're doing is we're oring three bits together. We're getting a pattern that represents in computer form the logical statement that came in. A logical uh, statement is made. It comes back as a three bit number. The possible results are the, you know, the integers 0, 1, 3, and 7. And if anything else is outputted, somewhere there's been a, uh, an error in the mathematics. So the classifier, this is the word that's a little bit complicated. Uh, this accepts on the stack the year, uh, the class, that's the prototype of the number starting at 0. You put in the year, the class, the divisor, and then the weight that that uh, divisor has um, in four year, uh, 100 year, or 400 year. And the math is applied on that basis. So now we devolve down to Bill's do to create does. So we're going to create three words that do the classification. Uh, uh, the uh, four classify word handles the four-year divisibility, the 100 classify handles the 100-year divisibility, and the 400 the same there. And you see the weights of one, two, and four are associated. The A-class word creates uh, the name, adds those two parameters in, and then when this particular word executes, it just retrieves those two parameters and calls the classifier. To apply them all, uh, the, the, the leap year process says we put in a prototype empty zero value. 
we do the four classify, the 100, the 400. Uh, we throw away the year, and what's left is the classified value at the very end. And again, as I said, the results are one, three, uh, zero, one, three, and seven. Then we do a selection. So this responds to that classification that's been made. It's a simple case statement. And if this receives a zero, it's going to output and is not a leap year. If it gets a one, it's going to say and is a leap year. If it gets a three, it's going to say and is not a leap year. And if it gets a seven, it's going to say and is a leap year. So there's two cases of not leap year, two cases of leap year. And at the very bottom, the, the dupe is an error in classification. That's only if I've got a programming error. And I must admit, as I developed this, I had a couple of cases where I got that last classification, which immediately revealed that I had some kind of computational error. So here's a demonstration. The uh, top level word again is answer. And it, it does the uh, classification by LY process and does the selection and gives us the English language output. So if we type in, uh, 1995 answer, we get 1995 is not a leap year. 1996 is a leap year. Uh, 1900 is not a leap year and 2000 is a leap year. And in the interest of uh, trivia, we find out that in the original um, Microsoft uh, best basics and spreadsheet, they treated 1900 as a leap year. Um, I'm not sure why, I'm not sure if they know why. But that has been preserved. So if you go into Excel spreadsheet, 1900 will report as not a leaper when it actually is. So for extra credit, we're going to accept the years of Roman numeral. So in that case, the format's going to be a word final and then the year number uh, in Roman numerals, and it'll give us a report. And it will check to see is it a leap year and also what its uh, um, Arabic number value is. So the method is we're going to parse from right to left. The year 1947 would be MCMXLVII. Starting from the left, we see two I's, which will give us a value of two. We see a V will give us a value of five. We'll see the L, which will give us a value of 50. And then the X will be subtract 10. Then we get M for 1,000. And to get 19 or the nine, we subtract C subtracts a hundred, so we get nine, and then the for initial M is 1,000. So we see one, nine, four, seven. So the algorithm is to accept each character and accumulate its weight. If the character to the left is smaller, subtract its weight. Then if the next character is the original character, uh, do a repetition because we do things like X, I, X. So the X will appear twice. Finally, then we move to the next higher weighting and again, parse uh, right to left. Here's the setup on the program. We set up an area called scratch, which has 20 character space. And that's where the Roman text will reside. Offset is the letter in which we're processing and result is the decimal value. So when we set up uh, to initialize, We'll clear Scratch, and I will uh, transfer the Roman numeral text to Scratch and set the results to zero. Get Roman accepts the next uh, uh, text, just as we would any other source code, code word in fourth. So BL word accepts the text, gives us its address as a counted string. Scratch over C fetch one plus move puts it into the Scratch buffer, and then we initialize for calculation. Uh, we're going to fetch one character at a time. We're going to start from the, uh, the right end of the string. So this will fetch the, the, uh, the uh, current character that's pointed to uh, by the offset, one character at a time. It does not remove this from the string. It just retrieves the character. Here's where the work is done, process XX. We give it the weight that this character ca uh, carries. Uh, I carries the weight of one, V carries five, and so on. The X is the ASCII value of, of the character as a number. And then direction DIR says, are we going to add it or subtract it? So at each phase here, we know the weight we're going to apply. 
the character we're going to apply it to, and the direction, is it going to increase or decrease the final result? And so you see it's a being a while repeat. The begin checks for the presence of the character in the match. If the character is present and does match, we decrement the offset, which gobbles the character, and then um, the over R fetch plus times two plus result puts a adjusted value into result. It may be added or it may be subtracted. Then we set up a weight for each letter. So for the letter I, we set up a one associated with the ASCII character uh, I, and then do the process XX. When we execute V, we will uh, do the same with a weight of five for the letter V, and so on, X, L, C, and D. And then in the case, it's somewhat similar to Brad's. We're actually setting up a word associated with each character, but uh, it's interpreted, not executed. I love that. Before we get to the final parsing, I'll point out what I call the 19 problem. And the basic rule says that if a letter appears to the left of a higher value, its value is subtracted. And so XIX traditionally would be 19. However, that rule does allow you can have VIIII, which in Roman days was often done, or you could have X. V X I I I, which is allowable, or you could have I X X, which is allowable. And they all meet that rule. There is no official syntax for Roman numerals. Even the Romans violated the rules because at the Colosseum, uh, at one place they they uh, used for the number four they used I V, and another place on another these are on the uh, the gates as entrance of the Colosseum. In one gate number, they had four represented as a uh, V I I I I as a and the number nine as a V I I I I, and in another place they had it as an I X. So even they violated their little rules. And I will point out that one of the Roman legions was numbered I I X X, which was eighteen. So this does the parsing letter by letter. It's a fairly elaborate word because this is just taking each letter right to left, letter by letter by letter. So the first thing it does is for, uh, for number one process I, it says process the letter I, and the number one says, if it exists, uh, add it in. Uh, the next line is one process V, which if the letter exists, it will add five. But then it has to go back and check to see there may be then a subsequent I, which in this case would be subtracted. So now we have a minus process I. So it says, if an I exists, process it, but subtract the value. And then there may be some more Vs. So we drop down again and say process V. And so there may be some more Vs. Now in the normal syntax, this actually should never occur, but it is possible. Finally, we get down to I process X. So in that case, upon each X, there may be more than one. All the X's will be processed. Each one will add 10, but we have to allow there may be a preceding I or a preceding V. So they are allowed for, and we go back and check there may be some more X's. And then finally down through L, we have to make three letter checks for L. We get down to C for a hundred and we have to process it and then make four checks. We get down to D and finally to M. And with an M, we actually have to look for a preceding value of all uh, prior um, numbers. So the processing, the um, uh, processing is very obvious, very clean, and a little bit elaborate. So here's our final structure. We're going to use the get Roman, which inputs the uh, value, and then I do a scratch count type, so I display what the word is we're processing. Then we do the Roman process, which gets us to our um, year number. And then finally, the result, uh, we take the result and pass it to the leap year process and leap year selection for a report. So our examples there are going to be a number of years. There's five examples shown. And here's how they come out. We get an English language output, which says MCM is 1900 and is not a leap year. The uh, other examples down to the bottom, which is the current year is MMXXII is 22, uh, 2022 and is not a leap year, which is the current year. So what we've done is we've taken a 
two small problems and made them into large problems. Very factored, very well factored, very readable, and also uh, very modifiable for other use. So this could all, could, as we have seen, this could all have been done in three lines or so, but by using 32 lines, we get a general modular solution. And the uh, nice part was the linkage of the two problems was automatic. When I did the Roman numerals, I then loaded the leap year and did a simple call and it worked the first time. So it is very heartening to know that you've got um, transportability on programs of, you know, able to be used sort of as a library ability and on a, on a casual usage, you get the right answer the first time. So do we have any questions? Good, my hearing is not so good. So the fewer questions, the better. Okay, uh, I'll turn it back to uh, Kevin. Thank you very much for your rapt attention. And my address is bill at billragsdale.cc. That's bill at sign billragsdale.cc. If you have suggestions for a challenge, please let me know. Yes, Back I strongly Kevin. encourage you to uh, either speak directly to Bill about that uh, or uh, contact me. I'm forther at comcast.net. Uh, Maybe uh, you can use your Uber challenge next month, Bill. Uh, how do you feel about that? Got to unmute. Still got to unmute. Oh, uh, well, you know, you can't unmute while you're chatting. Uh, yeah, very <laughs> good. Um, yeah, um, so I didn't do the uh, Uber cash, cash box report. We'll do that next week, next month. Thank you. Yeah, maybe uh, that's February, maybe in March, we could do uh, the uh, fabulous uh, list the dates of a random year of the fourth meetings. Here's the another one. The fourth uh, meetings which, of a random year. Yeah, here's another one which we may get to. And this one is, is quite difficult. I will say it is quite difficult. Um, and that is that in Europe and increasingly, increasingly the United States, they do calendaring by week number, a week number of the year from one to 53. And the rule is that the first week of the year is the week that contains the first Thursday. So if the first of the year is on Thursday or before, that is week one. However, if New Year's Day is on Friday or Saturday, uh, that is week 53 of the prior year. And uh, this has been added to Excel in the last couple of years. Um, I use it for financial reporting and uh, Europe, it's very common. And in some large corporations, Honeywell Corporation, for example, uh, does this for calendaring and for financial reporting because you can break the Europe by uh, 13 week chunks, 13, 13, 13, and, and uh, 14. So uh, think about uh, uh, somewhere in the next month or two or three, you're gonna see the challenge to compute the year number, uh, the week number from a year. I remember when I used, to, I remember I used to work for Big Deal Aerospace. All our uh, time cards were, uh, were numbered. They had a week number on them. Sometimes it was not intuitively obvious which week you were in. <laughs> they were uh, hollerith sized pieces of uh, cardstock that would actually go into a key punch machine back in the dark ages until it evolved into a more sophisticated system where they coded directly keyboard to hard drive, uh, spinning rust, and then eventually <laughs> shortly after the, uh, I don't know, it was a long while when they gave up the, the punch card uh, system to transition into uh, online deal. Uh, the rest of the world had moved on from that. So uh, something about Don's talk, uh, 
interested me, many things about Don's talk interested me, but the, the comment that fourth is really the only language in hardware uh, implementation. I remember back in the olden days, there were P-code uh, engines of various sorts. I saw two or three or four of those implementations back in those days. Uh, bit slice, uh, AMD bit slice was popular for implementing that sort of thing. Uh, is anybody aware of a, a basic in where? I'm, I don't know that uh, executing basic tokens was really worth <laughs> getting out your, uh, your soldering iron for. They put it uh, in ROM, remember that? Uh, what was it, a Commodore or somebody put it in ROM? But that was the closest. They never put it in the processor. <laughs> yeah, I guess uh, APL uh, probably uh, doesn't uh, doesn't strike me as as I don't recall hearing about any hardware implementations. Bob, are you there? He would know. <laughs> Any other hardware implementations of languages besides the P code engines of the olden days? Was that in the 70s? Um, well, there were the Lisp machines, right? Where they tried to sort of design the architecture around Lisp. And... Well, be, be careful with that because the Lisp machines that most people are familiar with are actually stacked machines underneath the hood. Um, but yeah. if you look at the history of the scheme programming language, um, Sussman, uh, I believe, actually implemented an honest to goodness scheme interpreter, including garbage collection in silicon. Um, oh, wow. It did not perform terribly great, but it did actually work. You can experiment with that stuff today with FPJs and system Verilog. Oh yeah, yeah. Implementing a scheme machine today in, with modern FPGAs would probably uh, blow the covers off of uh, Sussman's original chip for sure. There was uh -oh. a uh, Pascal machine um, out of, I think, UC Santa Barbara. They, put, they developed a portable Pascal that ran on PDP 11s. And somebody came out and made a hardware box for it because I bought one. I, I bought the box with the Pascal in the box. Uh, never ran it. Never even turned it, plugged it in. Would it plug into a PDP-11 or a QBus machine? No, it was a standalone computer. It wow. was a Pascal box. You put a terminal on it and it would say, okay, or whatever Pascal did. And it used the P codes of... Um, that uh, that their Pascal was was developed in, and I'm pretty sure it, internally it had a like a bit slice uh, process executing those uh, I guess eight bit byte P codes. Yeah, there were there were a couple of those around back in those days. The NCR folks had a P code executor hardware engine. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think the company I currently work for, uh, Western Digital, got their start with uh, P code uh, execution engines. Now that you met, now you mentioned, I think Western Digital was the one that made this box that I bought that had Pascal in it. Pretty sure they were the one. There were also um, some some attempts, although I don't think any of them ever really made it to market to do Java Java bytecode in in hardware as well. Right. What was the parallel processor for AI chip? Remember there's like that, the single chip? I think it, they're still out. Uh, God, I'm trying to remember. It starts with a T maybe? Yeah, Sun had a, a single chip Java executor thing. It, it never saw the light of day out in the, out in the world, but I think that uh, it existed. Arm had some uh, CPU cores with Jazel, they called it, executing about what they claimed 85% of the dynamically occurring 
Java bytecodes in hardware, but part of the documentation was never released. I think once we get we get our system done, people could could play around with all that stuff. You could implement opcodes for anything. You know, you could you know choose some language to uh, to implement. <laughs> You just have to write uh, it in fourth with our or system bear log, either way. You know, I have also some very bad uh, experience with uh, Java engines uh, in hardware. There were some ships of ST, um, and the problem was uh, Oracle had a download for a complete fourth system, a complete Java engine system for a special kit of one of the ship manufacturers. So, and then I wanted it, and then there was no download. And everybody in a special group said, no, we don't, are not allowed to give it to you. And then I asked the Oracle uh, staff member, and he said, even he was not allowed to get a copy. So it's in a poison wardrobe, as we Germans say. And the companies which try to make money with it have licenses like this. You can buy the cheap board, you can buy an evaluation version, but you're not allowed to make any project with it. So these companies have the business model to have at least 50,000 or whatever, or even more euros um, to pay if you want to make an, a business with a Java runtime engine. That's a, that's a total difference to, uh, to force, of course. And I was told some of the ships were already designed for force in the 1980s, early 1990s, and then they were renamed to be Java engines. Because, oh, yeah. okay, they did the Java engine uh, uh, again. Patriot Scientific comes to mind for that one. Um, I think ARM also made a, um, a set of risk chips that had uh, a separate instruction set intended to facilitate Java execution as well. Those lasted fairly short in the market, but uh, I believe they did come to market. Here, there's the reference we dug up. It said uh, the Pascal Micro Engine is a series of microcomputer products manufactured by Western Digital from 1979 to 1980s, designed specifically to run UCSD Pascal. Uh, the um, Pascal P code is the machine language. So the ARM 9 and I think ARM 11 course had an optional Java direct execution mode, which was intended to make the JVM more lightweight. And one of the selling points was it's Java compatible and you can get away with slower, smaller flash because Java bytecode is compact, which should sound familiar to fourth programmers. <laughs> if you don't mind, I'd love to hear a discussion on stateless fourth. So I was reading a little bit about it. Someone put up something about fourth compilers and color fourth like beat the snot out of everything. Um, and color fourth is, uh, doesn't have a state variable, right? So how do you, how do you do that? Like uh, if we were to try to implement that, oh, how would we do that? Fourth, I had fourth incorporated discussion. polyfourth doesn't have a uh, so, um, I had a long discussion with that because the uh, fourth for the propeller chip is stateless as well. Uh, about how to retrofit this to uh, MacWisp Stellaris, uh, native uh, code generating for, for ARM microcontrollers. And the idea is the following, you drop the stage driver and you're also, and because you have to compile, now you're stuck in compile mode. And on your prompt, you have a scratch pad buffer and you always compile an anonymous function to this scratch pad, execute it, and then you reset the uh, code generation position to the start of the scratch pad buffer. So while instead of evaluating a line, you uh, process it, but how do you do deal with immediate words now? Well, 
the best thing he could think of, uh, Matthias and I was uh, that when you encounter an immediate word, you execute what you already have in the scratch pad, but don't drop it. Instead, you just continue afterward by calling the immediate word. There's one version of a stateless machine that I saw. Uh, it has two interpreters. It has an interpreting interpreter and a compiling interpreter. So left bracket is the interpreting compiler or interpreting routine. And everything after that will be text that will be interpreted. And uh, right bracket is the uh, uh, anything following that will be compiled. And this is essentially, this is exactly what we do when we use left bracket and right bracket. So by using those two in their strictest form, no need for the state variable. Yep, pick me, I was just about to mention that pick me forth works exactly that way. But I wonder in fabric if a state variable is that expensive. It's a single bit. Yeah, it's a the, single bit and it's gonna run it. The price bangers. is another one. Especially when you're dealing with hardware, one of the problems is that your uh, line executes at the speed of the uh, inter outer interpreter. So uh, if you want to, for example, bit bang on a single line interactively or something like that, uh, you have vastly different timing in co a compiled word instead of on the uh, prompt. And the other problem is that you have a lot of duplication in your fourth kernel. For example, lots of words like uh, char or something need one version for use of, with state equals zero and another one inside. And you get, can get rid of almost all of this kind of special case or tick and tick in braces, a uh, bracket, sorry. If you designed your fraud system as stateless from the beginning, you probably end up with a smaller kernel. Yeah, the, right. Yeah, the method that you're describing, Jan, is a much later development. Um, and I think that if I were to do it, that's probably the way I would go today. Is there a paper you can point me to that talks about this? Uh, the propeller fraud code does it. Uh, Tachyon fraud, I think it's called. Yeah, yeah, I know Peter. Uh, yes, I always he's not be, his last name. He's the person to debate with, but uh, he could probably tell you about the problems he encountered while writing his self-hosted fourth system for the propeller chip that way. Yeah, and it right. sounds like you I, wind up with pluses and minuses like anything else. <laughs> I suggest you guys correspond with regard to this offline. Uh, if you uh, uh, come up with anything, I'd be pleased to uh, put it down as a talk for next month. And speaking of which, I'd like you all to think about talks for uh, next month. Uh, Give me a line, forther at comcast.net. Uh, and uh, think of uh, challenges. Uh, if you don't want to give a talk yourself, but want to suggest it uh, for other folks to, uh, to talk about, we'll entertain those too. Uh, not, as, not as nice as, uh, as having somebody present something, but uh, maybe somebody else would be willing to pick up the challenge of, uh, of talking about it. Uh, we'll hope to see you all next month. And with that, uh, any other comments, questions, uh, send me your uh, donations for the continuance of the uh, rent on the uh, storage uh, locker for the Mountain View Press things. I want to remind you that that's desperately needed because uh, I haven't got that much money. <laughs> All right, with that, the unceremonious uh, stopping of the recorder, Brad. <laughs>